Yeah, I want to reuse substitution. Yeah. And all the videos should be up and on YouTube until updated. Okay, uh, here's here's something kind of cool. We're starting. I just I'm, I'm excited to just do some examples. That we're at the end of the year. We get to do some kind of higher level calculus stuff here, some strategies. We we talked on you know last Wednesday about how you know we could harness the power of logarithms to kind of ratchet down the complexity of these of these arithmetic problems. Remember we said the theorems exponentiation and multiplication and multiplication division and addition subtraction makes things a little simpler in that respect to do some problems, some differentiation problems that would otherwise be pretty ugly. I mean, this is one that I, I probably made you guys do this, something like this, earlier in the year when we were practicing the chain rule and, and you know, doing complicated derivatives involving all our derivative rules. Uh, but if we want to differentiate this, that's going to be a bit of a mess. Doable, but a bit of a mess, right? I've got a quotient rule, and within the numerator, I've got a uh, chain rule issue, right? And from the denominator, I've got a chain rule issue. And so it's, you know, it'd be kind of ugly to do. We could do it and clean it up with the algebra, but any suggestions? Any ideas for what maybe could uh, We could try u substitution, but it's not going to do us a lot of good here, honestly. If we use u sub, I'll, I'll just, I'll shorten that argument a little bit. Probably the only viable choice would be like x squared plus 1. And that's going to give us a du of 2x uh, dx, right? And that doesn't fit well with the top, does it? No. Right? I mean, you might be able to make something like that work. It would be kind of tough, though. It's possible you could complete that substitution, but it'd be tricky. So you want to uh, drop the logarithm? Yeah. Yeah. What if we? Now, there's no logarithm. Right now, there's no logarithm involved in this function at all. But what if we just force it, you know, force the issue? What if we take the, the natural log of both sides of the equation, which, of course, we can do. It's an equation as long as I treat both sides equally. You know, that's, that's fine to do. So if I do this, the natural log of y equals the natural log of all that stuff. Should I turn this, these lights up? Is it oh, that's better? Am I good like that? You, you can see okay. Uh, so what's that do for me? On the left side, it you know made things a little more complicated, if anything. But on the right side, look what we got. What, what, how can I use my properties of logs to, to rewrite this? Okay, good. So we got the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. Good. And within that log of the numerator, what else could I do? If I'm taking the log of the top, what can I do with that too? Ah, okay, remember I can take exponents out as coefficients. So I could rewrite that as 2 times the natural log of x minus 2 minus, now what about, okay, good, we have square root to 1 half power. So I could pull the 1 half out front and make that the natural log of the quantity x squared plus 1. Now, can I do anything with this with this x squared plus 1? Can't, can I? There's a temptation to want to be able to get in there and, and maybe deal with that x squared. Why can't I? OK, because it's a, it's a term in a sum, right? Because I've got stuff that's being added here, I can't apply any property of logs to make that any simpler. Okay. So I'm kind of stuck there, but that's pretty good. That made that a lot simpler, didn't it? And on the other side, we've just got our natural log y. OK, so now if I want to differentiate from there, now here's where we have to kind of shift into implicit differentiation mode. My goal is to find y prime, right? y prime is just the derivative of y with respect to x. If I just differentiate both sides with respect to x, I'm going to get a y prime on the left, aren't I? If 
by the chain rule. What do I get on the left side if I differentiate with respect to x, if I follow my, my log rule for differentiation? What's the, I, really, I've just got the natural log of hand there, right? What is the derivative of log hand? What was that? Let's, let's remind ourselves real quick. The derivative with respect to x of log u is what? One over u, the u dx, right? But didn't we just prefer to write that as u prime over u? Right? That's the, really the best way to do it, easiest way to write it. So I've got the, whatever the argument of that log is, whatever's inside the log, the derivative of that's on top, and it just goes on the bottom. Right? So if we move back up here then, take a second look at this. I'm taking the natural log of y, so what's the derivative of log y? y prime over y, isn't it? Right? Instead of a u, we just got a y, but it's it's the derivative of the argument, so y prime divided by the argument. y prime over y, y, right? Now what about the other side? Well, I can leave that 2 out front, can't I? That's just a multiplier. What's the derivative of log x minus 2? So x minus 2 is just hand. So I've got to do the derivative of that divided by that, right? Well, what's the derivative of x minus 2 with respect to x? 1. There you go. Right? Think so? Minus, and I can leave that 1 half out front. Uh, 2x over x squared plus 1. Good, yeah, the derivative of x squared plus 1 is just 2x over x squared plus 1, right? Make sense? All right. And I can clean that up a little bit. I could multiply this straight across so I get 2 over x minus 2 minus, cancel those guys, right? x over x squared plus 1. Now that's y prime over y. So if I want to solve for y prime, what's the last step to isolate y prime? Say it again. Multiply by y. Multiply by y, yeah. So y prime just equals all that stuff times y, but what's y? I prefer not to write this in terms of x's and y's. I prefer to write that in terms of, in terms of x's, but lo and behold, look what we got there. There's our y. I could just plug that back in, couldn't I? Exactly. And honestly, unless there's some simplification we can do, and there's really not. There's, I mean, there, you know, there's not a lot of simplification. We maybe we could combine these fractions and possibly, but we don't really need to. This is our function. Think what derivative functions are good for. Typically, if we're taking a derivative, it's because we want to be able to evaluate it and find the slope of the curve, right? Which we can do. I can plug in values of, of x and get it, get it an answer, right? Uh, this is really not a bad way to leave this thing because we know that y is defined right here. And so rather than make this thing really complicated looking, this actually isn't a bad way to do it. We just write it in terms of the original function, which we can always plug in if we want to. Does that make sense? And all I have to do is just, is just write that extra function or that extra expression on the end there, and it, it looks really impressive, but there's a lot of x's. So it was a little more compact. But there's our answer. How about that? Right? So that's, that's a technique. It's called logarithmic differentiation. We use the, the benefits of the log, the power of the log, to make things simpler. You know, we just took the log on both sides, made things simpler with our properties of logarithms, and then differentiated implicitly to get our y prime. It's a good trick. I'll give you a short opportunity to practice a couple things, but it's, you know, it's not a real big deal. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just introduce 
and then maybe we can go to the lab here at the end. Uh, because, because the domain of the natural log function, remember what it looked like, included only positive numbers, right? If we graphed a log function, didn't it look like that? Right? It's undefined, it's asymptotic on the y-axis, and it's undefined for negative values of x. So it's only defined for positive numbers. Sometimes we write the log rule for differentiation this way. Derivative with respect to x of natural log of the absolute value. Yeah. What did that do to change things? Absolutely nothing. And, and this is literally the way to kind of think about this. When you see a natural log function written this way, where it involves, I mean, a derivative of a natural log where it involves absolute values, it doesn't change anything. The rule is still the same. Okay. So it's, it's only there to just, in certain cases, to ensure that, that you're not plugging in negative values into a log function because you can't do that. Okay. That's all it's there for. It literally is interchangeable with the one that we've written without the absolute value signs. That was always confusing to me when I first saw that. I thought, no, what's, I always look for something more profound there. And it's just there isn't anything. It's just you treat it the same way. The rules are all the same. Okay, so if that's true, then here's my last thing I kind of want to do here is just kind of get us ready for, set us up for next time a little bit. How could we take, you know, the derivative rule we got, you're practicing it, uh, it's not that big a deal. How could we use the derivative rule to develop an indefinite integral or an anti -derivative? And, and, and this, I'll use this opportunity to again illustrate how do we do this process. So if we start with this, how do we turn that into an integral? Remember what the steps are? So we've got the derivative with respect to x. natural log of the absolute value of u equals, I'm going to write it this way, 1 over du times dx. Remember, what we want to do is we want to write this in, in differential form. So we're going to multiply both sides through by dx. And, we want to get this. and really what that serves to do is just gets rid of the x's. We're writing this in terms only of u. So we're, we've left the 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 variable ambiguous. Could be x, could be anything. Okay, so if I multiply both sides by dx to put this into that differential form, what's that going to do? Well, obviously I'm going to get rid of the dx on this side. What's it going to do over here? Same thing. We cancel those out, right? And so written in differential form, we just get the derivative of log, natural log of the absolute value of u equals du over, whoops, that's supposed to be a u, isn't it? My mistake. Yeah. You were probably a little catch in that wondering what I was doing. Right? That's what we get. Okay, and now, if I want to write the corresponding indefinite integral or antiderivative rule, all I have to do is just integrate both sides. So what happens if we do that? Or if we go like that? Well, on the left side, integral of a derivative does what? The antiderivative of a derivative, they just cancel, don't they? Right? So these guys do away with each other, right? And let's flip these around. So we're going to put him out front. We'll put this guy over there, and we end up with <coughs> the integral of the u over u equals that, right? The natural log of the absolute value of u. And of course, what do we also have to include if it's an indefinite integral? Plus c. So we got it, right? There's our there's our uh, integral rule. Or natural logs. Okay, so let's just try.
try using that tiger too. How about substitution here that would make that work. Okay, what if we big X squared plus three? Let's do that. So if we pick U equals X squared plus three, what's D equal? Two X. Yeah, times times is gamma. So if I make that substitution then We've got an x dx right there, right? And we've got, it looks like, a u on the bottom. So what's that going to look like then in terms of u's and du's? On the bottom, we said we had u. What's x dx equal to? If I solve for that, I'm going to have to divide by 2, and I get a 1 half du. OK, now that's a rule we now have. What's that equal to? Okay, so there's our one half natural log of the absolute value of u plus c, right? Reverse the substitution, and we got it. u is x squared plus 3. Okay, do I need the absolute values there? Yeah. I don't. You say, no, how come? Maybe. Yeah, right. Yeah, because it's x squared plus 3 is positive value. It always is. x squared is non negative. So we know that I could do away with those. I could just write it instead as a, the quantity x squared plus 3. been tempted in the past to try to write that in terms of the sines and cosines. And you probably could. You probably could make that work, I bet, if you wrote that in terms of sines and cosines. Really? Of substitution. Really? Uh, okay, but there's an easier way, isn't there? Because we can see that if I pick my u carefully, this works out to be a real simple substitution. If I just let u equal tangent x, What's the u? Secant squared x dx. So there's my du, right? And so this becomes what? Du over u. But it's a definite integral. So what do I do with my limits here? Yeah, we're just going to evaluate. 
evaluate the limits in terms of u, aren't we? We're going we're to change it. When x is negative pi fourths, what does that make u? I just use my, my little key down there. I've got my u substitution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now you can think of it this way: tangent is sine over cosine, right? What's what's the sine of negative pi fourths? force right there. Sine is going to be, okay, okay, so negative square root of 2 over 2. Cosine is going to be positive square root of 2 over 2. So it's negative 1, isn't it? Right? Does that make sense? So the tangent there, the, the y component is the opposite of the x component at that point. Right? So that's just going to be negative 1. What about at positive pi fourths up here? Yeah, that's where the, the at, that's 45 degrees, isn't it, right? That's where the, the x and y components are going to have the same value, and so their ratio quotient would just be 1. Oops. So that's what I get. No big deal. That's just natural log of absolute value of u from where to where? Negative 1 to positive 1. But I have to use this, this absolute value, don't I? And so what's that actually going to give me if I evaluate that from negative 1 to 1? That's going to give me 0 overall, isn't it? Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, because I'm going to get the natural log of 1 minus the natural log of 1. So I'm actually going to get 0 for that answer. Okay. Okay, maybe one last one. I want to just look at it real quick. Um, let's stop. that. Now look at that integrant. It's kind of an ugly looking integrant. x squared plus x plus 1 over x squared plus 1. Looks pretty ugly. I mean, obviously there's not going to be a, a u and a du that's going to fit that, right? Uh, okay, but, but this time we can't because it's stuck inside an integrant, right? Any suggestions? Well, maybe we do want to do And, and say it again. We can't really cancel anything because the bottom, the bottom doesn't factor, does it? And so can't do a lot with that. But there is something we could do. You're, you're, you have sort of an idea. It's not really canceling. Could we do something to that integrand though? Think back in the past. We've done just a little bit of this. If we've got a real complicated integrand. We've had to do some algebra sometimes to make it look like some look like one of the, the rules. The uh, I don't think the top factor is either. But how about if I divide them out? Right? I've, I've actually got a polynomial, a second degree polynomial divided by a second degree polynomial. And so if I divide those out, uh, you can see I'm going to get, because the leading term on the bottom is the same as the leading term on top, I'm going to get 1 plus something. Now, I'm going to look at this in two ways. This is really kind of a pre-calculus issue in a way, but this is where you can start to really grow as a mathematician. You can start to see these things you know, in an easier way. Well, if we divide this out using long division, so this goes inside, that goes outside, right? So x squared plus 1 dividing into x squared plus x plus 1. Good practice here, long division. Remember what we do with long division. We want to know how many times does the leading term outside divide into the leading term inside. So x squared divided by x squared is 1. So if I distribute that through, I just get x squared 
plus 1. Remember, I'm just subtracting, right? So those guys cancel, those guys cancel, and I just get x as my remainder, right? And so what this is really equal to, if I just look inside the blue bubble, inside the blue bubble is really just equal to 1 plus x over x squared plus 1. Right? And that's two separate integrals. Right? I can I can split that up so that just looks like the integral of dx plus the integral of x over x squared plus one dx. I can integrate term by term, right? I've got this plus sign in the middle that's separating two terms. So I can break it into two integrals. Okay, well, the first one's pretty simple. Integral of dx is, what is that? x, yeah, it's just integral of 1 dx. That's just going to give us x, right? Now, what about over here? Is there a u substitution? x squared plus 1. So then du would just equal 2x dx, right? And so this ends up looking like, let's scoot down a little bit here. This ends up looking like, like uh, x dx is just a 1 half du. Right? And that looks an awful lot like natural log. We, did, we just did one very similar to this, right? So that's just natural log of absolute value of u plus c. If I plug this back in for u, x squared plus 1 is positive value, just like our x squared plus 3 was. And so we just get the answer, x plus 1 half natural log x squared plus 1 plus c, and we got it. Amazing. So dividing that out was the ticket. Now, was there maybe a, a way to reorganize, to reshuffle that, that integrand so it we didn't have to do that so such a complicated way. I've got a common denominator there shared by three terms in the top, right? This, this see, do you see this? This is this is kind of cool. What if I wrote that as I split those into x squared plus 1 plus x over the common denominator of x squared plus 1. So you just find the top property, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can, the commutative and associative properties of addition allow me to change, you know, add in any order I want to, right? And I can always split, I can split this into three separate fractions if I want to. When I have a common denominator, Common is the key word there. It means it's a denominator of each of the terms in the numerator. I can group them together if I want to, but I can also separate them. So I could write that as the integral of x squared plus 1 over x squared plus 1 dx plus the integral of x over x squared without even having to do the long division. How crazy is that? Does that make sense? Because look, this stuff right here just cancels to 1. If I just regroup that stuff. Right? That doesn't always work that way. It just so happened this time that, that I shared the same terms. What if that had been an x squared plus 3 on the bottom? Uh, and an x squared plus x plus 1 on the top. Would have been a little bit trickier then, wouldn't it? Still could have done something like this, though. What if they, you see what I'm saying? What if this had been a 3? I could write the top as x squared plus x plus 3 minus 2. You see that? Oh, okay. You could even do that if you want to, right? If that's how we started, you could write this as x 
squared plus 3 plus x minus 2 over my common denominator. Right? I can still do that. Still do that. Alright. See you, Uncle. Have a nice one day.